So growing up, one of the things that adults ask kids all the time is, is hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? And from the time I was five, I knew. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Um, my dad was a high school football coach, a very successful high school, high school football coach. And so I grew up in a program, in a, an environment that was centered on that. My mom was involved because my mom was co uh, taught at the middle school. And so she taught the middle school and all the, kid, the kids that went to her class eventually ended up playing for my father. And so the Cox family in the Bessemer area was very, very well established and very, very well respected because my mom was a great teacher, but also my dad was an unbelievable high school football coach. He was, he's in, been inducted to the Alabama High School Athletic Association Hall of Fame. Um, just unbelievable pillar in that community. And so I grew up in that environment. From the time I was five, I was on the sidelines from, and even after, at practices and on the weekends and things like that, I was involved there in season, off season, all that. Everybody knew me, I knew everybody, and it was a, it was a great environment. So I knew what I wanted to be. I didn't want to be a doctor, I didn't want to be a lawyer, I didn't even know what all that crap was. I wanted to coach college football. And so as I got older, my dad wouldn't let me play until I got to middle school, which I'm a father of three and I won't let my son play until he gets to middle school just because there's so many different things that go along with that. And so I got to start playing in middle school, but the thing is, I, I did not get to play for my father, for my father's middle school. I had to go to the other, other the rival's middle school because the school that my dad was at was not a great <clears throat> academic institution, but also there were discipline issues that they had had and so he didn't want me to be there. Um, and so I went to the other middle school. So growing up, I was always the kid that his dad was the coach at the other in the other town, in the rival's town. And so I was somewhat ostracized as a kid. Never made fun of, not, not made fun of per se, not picked on per se because of who my dad was, but I was ostracized because I was different. I didn't grow up there. Um, and so that, that, was, that was a little bit different. Um, so then go through middle school, get to high school, and I start playing. Was I a great athlete? Absolutely not. I was a good athlete that worked really hard and I knew the game. So in turn, I had success from kids that were just regular old players. Uh, was it an advantage my dad being a, he a head coach? Absolutely. Was it an advantage me being there since birth? Absolutely. And so I took advantage of that. And so in the, in the 10th grade, again, I played at another school than for my father because he wouldn't allow me to go there because of the, the diff all the different circumstances. And so the first game I ever started, we lost because it was an unbelievable team. They were just better than we were. And then the second game I ever started was against my father. And so, and for the first time in 18 years, the team that I played for beat my father's team. And so, for the, and for the first time, and I think I think my dad was a head coach 21 years of the 27 he was there. So only two years of that 20 whatever years, he didn't go to the playoffs. That was one of the years he didn't go to the playoffs. It was the it was us beating them and putting them out. And so that started a, a relatively good high school career. Uh, ended up doing really, really well, but my, my, my high school coach at that school was great as well. And so he was one of the most influential people in my life as, as well. And so he left and went to another school. When he left, we transferred, we had a, a coach come in my junior year. He just wasn't a good fit. Um, we had a great dynamic there and he just didn't mesh well and made some mistakes. Uh, on a number of different levels, and we were really, really bad. And so we go from being very, very good my sophomore year to being very, very poor with the same team, but then also I hurt my shoulder. So as a thrower, I played quarterback, as a thrower, my right shoulder was was huge. It was what I did, it was, it was, it was a big part of me, and so I had to have surgery my November of my junior year, which I thought in turn that I, it, it could have been the end of my career, but the doctor said I, I was gonna be able to throw again, I'll be fine. And so I, I had hope and I thought I would be fine. But the problem is I didn't get to go to camps, I didn't get to do all the things that junior, junior quarterbacks do, and so I was a little bit behind there. Um, so that was November of my junior year. So spring of my junior year, one of my best friends was killed in an accident. Uh, he played with me when I was a sophomore and he was a senior. He goes on to be, go to Vanderbilt and plays football at Vanderbilt, well then he died in an accident at Vanderbilt. So here we are, my junior year of high school, with, we lose, Tons of games. I have shoulder surgery and one of my best friends gets killed in an accident, all in about four or five months. Really, really rough year for us. And so and then we come to find out the coach that was there, he ended up being fired. And I did not want to go through a third coach in three years in the most important year of my, up until this point, my life. And so in the last year before that, they had made some changes at my dad's school. And so they had a great principal come in and he really, really flipped things around as far as from a discipline standpoint. And my dad said, hey, you wanna come play for me? And so I got the opportunity to do that. Now, 
The caveat to that is my parents were divorced. My parents got divorced when I was in middle school and my dad lived in another, and my dad lived in one town. And so there's so many rules with transferring. And um, we had to do so many things. We had to dot every I, cross every T. My dad did a wonderful job of making sure everything was legal. And come to find out on the back end, I didn't realize this time we had five schools in the state report us for doing something illegal. But everything was legal. And so I got to go play for my father. I had to move in with my dad, had to make it legal, had to change custody from my mom to my dad, which my mom absolutely hated. But she knew that it was for a reason and she loved it because she loved seeing me play for my dad. Even though they're divorced, my parents have a great relationship. So I got to go play for my father. And so, and it was a it was the perfect storm because they weren't great the year before and they had a quarterback to leave. And so I didn't come in and rock the boat. I came in to fill a need. They had a, had a great receiver, the guy that they ended up going to Mississippi State who was unbelievable, who made me look very, very good. And we had a great defense. So it was the perfect storm for success. We ended up doing really, really well. I ended up signing a scholarship at UAB, ended up going to UAB and playing there. And from the time I walked on campus, I knew what I wanted to do. I deal with college kids every day, and a lot of them have no clue what they wanted to do. I walked on campus, I knew I wanted to coach college football. The only reason I was there was to play football and go coach football. School was fine, but I was a, C, a B student. I was a 3.0 kid, struggled on the ACT, and but I was there to play ball. I did the work I had to do, but I was there for one reason, is to learn football, to play football, and to be great at that one day. And so I think looking back at it and what I'm doing now, I probably wish, I probably didn't put forth the effort I needed to on the other stuff to, to be great at it. But here's the thing, I didn't know that I was gonna be doing what I'm doing now. I thought from that time on I, was co I would coach college football. So I built my five years, notice I said five, not four. I built my five years of college around the next step of being in football. And worked my senior year and then into and, and tried to get a G, what they call a GA job, which is a graduate graduate assistant job. You don't make any money, but you're an assistant to assistant coaches. You learn tons of football. It's a great experience. So I tried for a year and a half to get that and couldn't get one. So I ended up moving to Atlanta to work with my dad because my dad retired from Alabama, went to Atlanta and coached there. So I got to work with my dad. So I get to play for my dad. I go five years and then in college, and then I get to coach with him. And, and live with him. It was wonderful. Um, worked really hard. I didn't have a lot of friends. I just went to school, I taught, I coached, and I worked, had a second job. I just worked really, really hard during those two years. Then I get married. And <clears throat> this is a story for another time, but I get married and we're gonna move to Atlanta and live happily ever after. I had resigned myself to, to the fact that I was gonna be a high school football coach. And I was fine with that. I love that, that world, I love Friday night. So I'm getting off the plane from my honeymoon and I get a call from a guy that used to be one of my dad's assistant coaches who was at NC State University. They had a GA leave in the middle of the night and he says, hey, do you want this job? We got a job for you. So I tried for a year and a half, really for three years, trying to get a GA college coaching job. And uh, here I was seven days after getting married. And I'm in, I'm, in, I'm in the Atlanta airport and he calls and I said, sure, we'll be there in two days. Again, long, long story about that, but I ended up, we ended up moving to Raleigh, North Carolina and coaching NC State University. And I was a GA there and absolutely loved it. Well, there, I realized what hard work was because uh, my boss, my, the head coach that hired me was Chuck Amato, who's a wonderful human being, wonderful man, loved family, valued family, valued hard work, but just an unbelievable guy. But my direct boss was the offensive coordinator, a guy named Mark Trustman, who has coached in the NFL. He's coached in Super Bowls. He's won great cups in, in the Canadian football league. He's been a head coach in the NFL. He's, he's unbelievable. His mind is unbelievable. And so I got to work for him for two years. <clears throat> I literally worked, and this is not being, this is a, a actual number. I was a 90 to 105 hours a week, at least seven months a year. And it taught me so much. I learned a ton about football, but I also learned a ton about life and just working and how to work hard and made no money. I mean, I made, I think I made $14,000 a year. So I worked a 90, 100 hours a week. I was in grad school and I made 14 grand. And it was, it was crazy. Now, thank goodness my wife had a job and, and so my wife had a job for the first, I don't know, three years I was married, my wife made a lot more money than I did. And so she worked and was a teacher and a coach and did great. And so I, we did that for two years, absolutely loved it. Chuck was great, he let Jackie travel with us. And so we had a wonderful first two years of our marriage. Well then in college football, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, we all got fired. Um, 
And so they let the head coach go, and so we all didn't have jobs. Well, at the same time, the guy that coached me in college, Watson Brown, took a job at Tennessee Tech University. And he called and said, hey, do you want to come coach for me? I said, sure. So I'm, I got a, the whopping raise from $14,000 to $25,000. And so I went to, we moved to Cookville, Tennessee, and for the first six months, absolutely hated it. It was, it was miserable. I had this small town. I went from Birmingham to Atlanta to Raleigh to these big towns and loving life to 37,000 people in a know-nothing interstate town. And I was just like, this is awful. So we were there for six months. Uh, Jackie waited tables. I coached, never saw each other um, because I was a, a full-time college football coach now. And so we went through that. After about six months, we started to like the town. It was one, it was started to be a wonderful, wonderful place. And then um, we started just, we grew. I grew in my career, Jackie grew in her career. She was a head volleyball coach at Cookville High School. I was a, a football coach at uh, Tennessee Tech University. And we did that for about, for about six years. During that time, we had a, our first child, Jonna, and she was wonderful. The problem was, is I was coaching, she was coaching. And I wasn't working 900 hours a week. I was working 70 or 80 hours a week, which is still a lot. Wasn't making much money, but we had that first child. And I really honestly feel like the first three years of her life, I missed a lot of it because I was working, Jackie was working, we were going and doing, and it was, it was hard. Uh, but we, we loved life because that's all we knew. We didn't make much money, but we didn't have any debt, praise God. And it was just, a, it was a good experience. We get, in, as, as a, a coaching career progresses, I changed, I changed a couple of jobs in, in, at Tennessee Tech University and end up starting to progress into making more money. And it was a good living. We had a good living. Jackie was working, I was working, it was great. We had our second kid, Tegan came along. And um, when he came along, it was a situation where I knew inside of me there was something that was like, hey, you may, be, you may be needing to do something different. So six months after he was born, I start thinking to myself, there's something else I may need to do. And so what I did is I went to my boss and said, hey, look, I said, I don't, I don't know what it is. I said, I love my job, but I think there may be something else I need to be doing. I said, I'm not sure if this is what I need to be doing. He said, well, what are you gonna do? I was like, I don't know. And so I said, here's what we'll do. I said, let's, get, let's go through the season. I'm gonna work my butt off. You know I will. I'm gonna recruit, I'm gonna coach. I said, let's, let's evaluate in December. We get three games into the season, and Tegan is not quite one yet. And my wife walks in and says, how's it going? I was like, I'm done. I knew three games into the season that I, I wasn't gonna do this anymore. Now, that didn't change the fact that I didn't work hard for my players and for my boss and all that kind of stuff. I did, I loved it. So I did that, and Coach Brown walked in about six games in, and he goes, hey buddy. He closed the door, he said, hey buddy, what are you, what are you thinking? I said, I'm done, Coach. I said, this is it for me. He's like, what are you gonna do? I was like, I don't know. I really didn't, I had no clue what I was gonna do. So I, I was a guy that loved my job, made plenty of money. I quit my job, but I didn't know why. And I didn't have anything lined up. So if you're, if someone's watching this, don't do any of those things <laughs> because it was crazy. I had nothing lined up, but I knew that I needed to be doing something else. So I get to the end of the year and uh, I resign, end up working in a church. Honestly, end up working in a church because I didn't have anything else to do. I wanted to stay in that town and it was, it was a good fit. I had a great boss, a guy named Greg Canada, hired me at the church and I did everything but communicate from the stage. I handled events, I did all these organizational things, a lot of stuff that I'm doing now. And it was a good kind of segue into what I'm doing. So backtrack a little bit. When I was at Tennessee Tech, I got really, really involved in CrossFit and got really involved in nutrition and the physical fitness part. And I've always been into that because I was into college, but I got really involved in that in, in when I was there. And it transitioned into my life at working at the church. And Greg walks in and says, hey, can you help me make a meal plan? I'm like, yeah, sure. Was I qualified to do that? Not really, but I was qualified from a standpoint that I had tons of experience with that part of myself and that part with our family. They had I advised anybody? No. But I started making meal plans for this guy, and then I started making some for somebody else, and then another person, and then another person. And so it was a domino effect from there. And here I was three months into working at the church, and I'm making meal plans for all these people on, from, the, from a borrowed laptop at the church. And so it ended up being great. And so that first year, we made out 8,000 bucks doing digital meal plans, emailing to people, no CRM, no nothing, just on Word. I mean, it just super, not janky, but just super un, unprofessional, I guess is what the word is. But it was fun. So I get about a year and two or three months in this job, my wife walks in and she goes, hey, 
you're working coaching hours again. And I was. But here's the thing I figured out this time. I like to work. I enjoy it. I enjoy accomplishing things. I enjoy seeing things come to fruition. I like to work. And so I went to my boss, Greg, who, who was still wonderful. And I said, hey, look, I'm thinking about, what do you think if I go part-time, work 20 hours? And at that point, when I cut back 20 hours a week, I took 20 hours a week from the church and I gave it to meal fit. Business exploded. And from the meal prep, meal prep perspective, it was great because what I did was I started spending that time doing the meal planning. And we went, in the back end of that year, I started making food. And that next year we made, we went from making $8,000 the first year to making about 80 the second. And it was a drastic shift in our lifestyle, drastic, not really a drastic shift in our lifestyle, drastic, drastic shift in what we thought we could do. So for the first time, I actually thought I could do something else because I was still like, this was something on the side, but then I realized we made $80,000 helping people with meal plans. And we had, we've done meal planning for people in 26 different countries over these years, which is crazy for me to think that. So the back end of that second year, still working at the church, I'm part-time, I start structuring my off days to where I can make food, make food for all these soccer moms. Because they start saying, well, because I started using Facebook and it, there was no Instagram at the time. So I started using Facebook <clears throat> to post pictures of what I was eating and the pictures were so bad. Oh, it was so bad. And so I, I but they still loved them. And so all the soccer moms were like, hey, we're not gonna do your plan, but if you start making this food, I'll buy it. And so I started doing meal prep out of a guy's borrowed lodge kitchen thing. It's a commercial kitchen, but I didn't have no health department. No, I was breaking, I was breaking all kinds of rules. But I started doing meal prep, just testing it out for people. I was there for about six weeks, and uh, some of the things that people don't know is I left the gas on one night in this guy's lodge, and he had worked so hard his whole life to have this thing, and he walks in, he was he was nervous, and it was Kevin Bowling. Kevin Bowling's crazy important to this business, and he said, hey, look, this is what happened. You left the gas on. He says, I can't risk it. He said, you gotta go. And so I had... <laughs> I had to leave this place. It was I was super sick, and so I went to another friend of mine, Mike Campbell, who was a pastor at a church in the town. And I said, "Hey, can I rent your kitchen? It's a beautiful kitchen." I said, "Can I rent your kitchen on Mondays?" He's like, "Sure." It was crazy expensive, so I started renting that place. Started doing meal prep for people, and then end of that year, I looked at Greg and I said, "Hey, look," I said, "I'm gonna do this on my own." I said, I'm gonna go full-time meal fit. So I started doing that. So I was just dabbling in the actual food, but still killing it on the meal planning stuff. And so I rented a 444 square foot kitchen in the middle of absolutely nowhere. It was an old barbecue joint that a guy had abandoned and had been sitting there a year. And so I started working out of there, no heat, no air. And so I started cooking from there. And then a friend of mine said something about me catering food for him. And I was like, sure. I had no idea how to do that. Started Googling things and what to do. And so I started doing that and then a friend of his asked and it just was a domino effect from there. And so here we are doing meal plans, meal prep and catering in a 400 square foot kitchen in the middle of nowhere, Cookville, Tennessee, and the business started growing. And again, I was working a ton, but absolutely loving every second of it. Wife didn't help. People ask all the time, does Jackie help? No, she does not. Um, she's a wonderful support, but she didn't have anything to do with this part of the business. And so we did that for about a year and we just, we grew. And we can talk to logistics of all that, but we grew and grew and grew and grew and grew, started and moved into downtown Cookville and had a place down there. And so Meal Fit at this time is a salad bar, it's meal prep and it's catering. And it was thriving in this little college town. Um, and I loved it. <clears throat> so I got a call one day after being in this, I think we're been in this four, four years, four or five years now. And I got a call one day and um, Mark Pettis, the president of Highlands College, called and said, hey, will you come and run our cafeteria at Highlands College? I'm like, what? And so we, they bought the Grandview building, which is now the Highlands College building. And they totally renovated it and asked if I could do the food for his college because it was so important, the healthy cooking, the, the part of the body that was so important to them at, at Church of the Highlands and Highlands College. He wanted someone that he knew, but he also someone that he valued the healthy part of life and how important food was. And he wanted this to be an integral part of his students' lives. And so we did that and we moved, we moved back to Birmingham. Never thought I would move away from Cookville, Tennessee. I absolutely love that town. I still to this day love that town. Some of my best friends are there. Some of my best friends will always be there. Um, but us moving back to Birmingham was a 
crazy, crazy thing because I never thought I would do it. But we moved back to Birmingham. And so throughout this whole process, it's been an amazing, amazing journey of ups and downs, very, very hard work, a, very, a lot of decisions that have been made that were made simply because of faith and making decisions to quit my job that I loved, making plenty of money to go do something that I had no idea what I was gonna do, to move back to my hometown, which at the time I did not wanna do. I loved my town. And so I made the decision to move back to Birmingham, which I was, I mean, my mom is gonna hate to hear this, but I didn't, I didn't really wanna do it. But I knew that I had to. I knew I was called to do this. And so those are things you can't put in books. Those are things you can't, there's not a step to learn how to do that. Those are things that it's just inside of you. Some people call it a conscience, some people call it the Holy Spirit. Pick your term, whatever it is. When when you are feel like you are led to go do something, you've gotta go do it. And so when we moved back here, it's been an amazing, amazing journey. We've had ups and we've had downs. We've had hard times in our in our marriage, just like all marriages do. We've had hard times with our kids, with our, you know, we had a kid that was really, really sick one time. And it's just been one of those things that's been a journey that <laughs> and what, at one, some point one day probably could be a movie or probably could be a book, but we've enjoyed every minute of it. It's been very, very difficult at times. It's been very, very fun at times. Um, the thing that I love most about what I do now is the selfish part of me is I'm my own boss. I can do what I want to do when I want to do it. The hard part is I'm responsible for a lot of people. I'm responsible for doing different things. And there's some things, some weeks I have to work 70 or 80 hours a week. And there's some weeks I can work 30. So I love that part of the business, but I also love the fact that I love helping people. I love making a difference in people's lives. I love the events. I love seeing people enjoy our food. I love people making it. I love when we do a wedding that the mom and the bride come up and say, it was amazing. We absolutely loved it. And the fact that she's already said, you're going to do our other two daughters wedding. Those types of things are fun. And so through that whole process, we have, we had meal fit meal fit was great. But then I realized that we needed another side of our business that could do the higher end, nicer, elevated experience, catering experiences. And so we started a company called Table and Time. And with that company, it is white glove, full service, um, the best that you can get as far as the food is concerned, as far as the service is concerned, as far as the experience is concerned. And that level and that part of our business has been so much fun to do from the starting of it, from the ground up, to the marketing of it, to the, the events, all those things. And so the things that we've done in the last, oh Lord, I guess, I mean, 15 years or so have been so much fun, but I enjoy all of it. Do I enjoy owning my own business? Yes. Do I sometimes hate that I own my own business? No. Is it hard? Yes. But it's a rewarding, experience that we have and I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world.